Can humans be the great filter for themselves? Is there a question that's impossible to answer? How do we point the solar gravitational lens telescope in the right direction? And in Q&A Plus, what's my most unpopular space take? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down, gather them up, and I will answer them here. I'm recording in another Airbnb. This time I'm in a place called Pak Chong, which is just outside the Khao Yai uh, National Park in Thailand. And yesterday we tried to see elephants and failed. All right, let's get into the questions. Ed, is there a question about the universe that's literally impossible to answer? Almost certainly there are questions that we will never know the answer to. And when you think about like some of the biggest questions, like where did everything come from? Right? Why is there something and not nothing? That's a question about the universe, right? Why does the universe exist? And if you go back through, you know, all of the evidence that we have about what's in the universe, we get to this place just nanoseconds after the beginning of the universe, where we can no longer really answer any questions about the nature of reality at that point. And there is this hard stop at the very beginning of the universe, at the moment of the Big Bang. It was like a clean slate. It wiped the evidence of the universe. Whatever came before was wiped and you had the universe that we live in today. Maybe, right? Probably. But maybe there's some echo, there's some piece of information that's here in the universe that is some hint at what came before. And so that would be incredible. I guess Nobel Prize is all around. And yet, all that does is just push the question one step back. Because okay, so now we've detected these echoes of the previous universe. And we've been able to figure out that some of the universal constants were slightly different than what they are now and had a different universe. And there was something that led to the Big Bang. And we kind of understand it. And you're like, okay, fine. But what came before that? You know, is there an echo inside of an echo? Well, it was just a big cycle. It always had been going. Okay, well, what started the cycle? Where did the first universe come from? Right? Like, you will always get to this place where you're like, yeah, but where did that come from? That that you will never be able to answer because it's just it's turtles all the way down. And so that's the kind of question that you have to be comfortable knowing that the answer will always be, we don't know that we will never know. Like, what if we wake up and realize that we're actually in a simulation? Okay, fine. So where did the simulators come from? Right? Oh, they're in a simulation too. Okay, fine. Where did they come from? And so no matter how you try to crack into this problem, you're always going to get to, I don't know. We don't know. We can never know. And to know that there is this, this horizon of unknown out there that can never be crossed. Um, in the beginning, sort of feels unsettling. And after a while, you feel very comfortable. And, and after a while, you kind of seek it. I, I really love the feeling of the mystery of not knowing the answers to things. And I think that's like a, a place you get to where some mysteries you hope are going to be are going to unfold and you'll find out the answer. Other ones, you just you have to just be comfortable in that uh, uncertainty. And uh, I think it's fine. Paige Potter, if the great filter is ahead of us, what part of human nature do you think will be tested most? The great filter is not a test of human nature. If it exists, the great filter is an inevitable outcome of an intelligent species, if it's ahead of us. So like the gist of the great filter, this is the theory by Robin Hanson that the way you explain the Fermi paradox, the lack of us seeing aliens is that there's something bad happens to every civilization. Now, maybe the great filter is behind us that you, you know, the great filter stops um, new species from becoming uh, multicellular. And so we've somehow passed through the great filter. And now the universe is ours to to explore. Uh, but maybe the great filter is in front of us that we have yet to run across the great filter. But when you think about the numbers involved, when you think about the four 100 billion stars that are in the Milky Way, with multiple planets, that is hundreds of billions of separate planets, where life could have started. And if life started on many of those worlds, many of those worlds would have gotten advanced and become technological civilization. And yet none of them went on to fill the solar system with von Neumann probes. We don't see monoliths poking out of the moon from all of the civilizations that have visited us and left their calling cards. The universe seems empty. 
And so if the great filter is in front of us, then it is something that has snuffed out every single technological civilization before it was able to expand out of its home system, all of them, in a way that was 100%, right? And so we can't predict it. Because if it's a thing that we can predict, it's the thing the other civilizations could have predicted, they could have avoided it. And so there's no aspect of human failing that it would play upon, because it would literally play upon the exact same failing of all aliens, all technological civilizations. It's the thing that unites all technological civilizations is they are doomed by the great filter. So, you know, and there are things that we can imagine like, oh, the robot uprising, getting hit by an asteroid strike, having a nuclear war. Uh, those are all things we can imagine. Therefore, they're ruled out because we can avoid them. We can use our wisdom to get around these things. Like maybe there's some kind of a science experiment. Maybe you get to a certain level of technology and you accidentally light your atmosphere on fire. It happens every time. That's the kind of thing. So like, is it progress? The, the, you know, the human failing is that we want to keep coming up with new technology, I guess. Ambition? maybe. But it seems pretty broad because it's happened to every alien civilization out there too. Jay Cowan, using our sun's mass as a gravitational lens to create a telescope sounds great. But how do you steer it and point it in different directions? Sounds pretty limited. Yes, using the sun as a gravitational lens is extremely limited. In order to use the sun's gravity, you have to take your spacecraft out to a distance of 550 plus astronomical units away from the sun. And then once you're out there, then you look at the sun, you block the light from the sun, you see the distorted gravitational image around the sun of whatever it is that you're looking at. And it magnifies the light to your telescope by orders of magnitude. It's like 30,000 times or something like that. Like it's huge. It will allow you to see a megapixel image of an exoplanet that is say 100 light years away on the other side of the sun. So that's the upside. The upside is that you're seeing a 1000 pixels by a 1000 pixels of a planet. You're literally seeing the continents, mountains, the oceans, that the the weather systems on that planet. The downside is that you can only look at that one object. And so to say you're limited, yeah, you cannot steer this telescope, you can only look at the one object that when you launch your spacecraft, it has to go down this very specific cone, this corridor on the other side of the sun from whatever it is the target that you're trying to image, it has to remain within that very tight area the entire time it just keeps getting farther and farther away from the sun, watching the sun and sort of keeping itself in line with the sun and then whatever it is the target you're attempting to image. And so if another even better planetary system has been discovered, and you want to be able to get eyes on that planet, you have to launch another spacecraft out to the solar gravitational lens to image it. And so whichever world is chosen to be the target for the solar gravitational lens telescope, it's got to be pretty special, because it's going to be very expensive to send a spacecraft 500 plus astronomical units away within a normal human lifetime. It's time to shout out our new patrons of the $5 level and above. John McMurray, Dan Lane, Vitor Murtiera, Cerceris One, JT, David Holbert, Kiba, Jerry Drake, Craig Allen Carr, and Oscar N. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Syndrome. How do I begin introducing my four and a half year old to science fiction? Are there particular books or resources that you can recommend? I think with a four and a half year old, I would recommend more science fiction television shows and, and movies like the Iron Giant. I mean, that's a little scary. I mean, I think you need to like, let their interests be your guide. And like when I was that age, I was more interested in dinosaurs and just space in general. And it wasn't about science fiction. It was about like, I wanted to know about the reality. I wanted I had books that I love to look at the pictures of the universe and space. And so I think you just have to sort of like help them like take them to the library and then sit down with different books and see what they like to look at and then use that as a way to kind of follow and judge and, and guide. I mean, science fiction is great if that's what you're into. And most people are right. Like if you go in and ask a person what their favorite movies are, they're going to give you a list that are largely contain science fiction movies, right? So you know, chances are 50 50, they're going to be into science fiction. 
and then your job is to just kick back. And chances are they're going to want to get into anime, science fiction, things you're not super into. But don't worry, they'll they'll come around in the end. Um, it's funny, my son is 21 now, and he's on a tear reading. And he's he's very much, okay, what's next? Like, what's next? What do I read next? And so I've been feeding him all of my recommendations, and he's just been destroying them. And then he's giving me tons of recommendations because he's starting to really develop his own taste. So, you know, he read a lot of more simple science fiction, like, um, you know, Andy Weir. Sorry, Andy, but they're accessible, right? Uh, he read the Weir Legion, Weir Bob books. But then he's gone, you know, he read Slaughterhouse Five and is now reading Ian M. Banks and giving me feedback about the books as he reads them. And, you know, you can't force it, but you can absolutely be there and provide nuanced recommendations as a person goes down this journey of enjoying. Like you can recommend the good stuff and keep them away from the the poorly written stuff. People got great recommendations. Planetarium, go out and see a meteor shower when you can. Teach them about the phases of the moon. Yeah, there's lots of good stuff that you can do that will uh, encourage them to be interested in science and science fiction and all that. Old timer. I've been watching a lot of old interviews with Isaac Asimov. Fraser, do you appreciate any of his literature? Absolutely. Isaac Asimov, like I have a lot of foundational, most influential science fiction authors. And a big part of that was just when I discovered science fiction. So I grew up, I was born in the 70s. And when I grew up, both of my parents were actually quite into science fiction. And so they had just the best home library sitting there. And it had Heinlein, Niven, my dad was really a big fan of Niven, and then a bunch of Isaac Asimov books and Ray Bradbury. So I had like these classic science fiction stories from their youth, just sitting there on this bookshelf. And when I was sort of like at the right age, and I was starting to read, and I was really starting to get into science fiction, I really like Star Trek, and I was starting to get into astronomy, I was probably like maybe 11 or so. And then in my high school, we, my teacher and like, oh my God, I'm thinking about this for the first time. I've never talked about this before. Um, yeah. So when I was in elementary school in grade six, my teacher, my English or my teacher at that point, you have, you know, one teacher for all your classes, um, gave us as our reading assignment, have spacesuit will travel. It's a science fiction, but it's like a kid science fiction book written by Robert Heinlein. And I read the book and it was just great, like adventure, rocketing around the solar system, lots of danger. And for my young mind, it was just, it was fantastic. And then I finished that. And then I like came to my dad and I said, I really enjoyed this. I see you've got Heinlein's on the bookshelf. <laughs> Tell me more. And so, so he recommended a couple of the books that were in his library that were sort of like the next level. So I read a bunch of Heinlein. There were tougher Heinleins and then kind of moved on from there, read Larry Niven, really enjoyed those and then moved on to Isaac Asimov. And, you know, I read the robot series. I read some of his like nonfiction books. Uh, he wrote, he wrote the, just an amazing science books. And eventually I made it around to the foundation books. And for me, they were life changing. Like I had already watched Star Wars as, you know, when I was six or whatever. And I had watched a ton of Star Trek, but when you read foundation, you get it. Like you get where they were all coming from. Like he wrote the sort of proto space opera and that all of those other shows were kind of adapt. I read Dune. I read all, you know, all the Dune books as I was going through high school. But I would say it was like Heinlein, Bradbury, Asimov, Niven were the, were kind of like this core group of sci-fi authors. But then I read, oh man, like I, I took track like one summer, I think I must have read 40 or 50 science fiction books in between school. Uh, so yeah, I was really into it. And and Asimov was a was a big influence on me and still is. Like I still go back and reread a lot of my Asimov books every couple of years. And my and I've I mentioned this in a previous episode. I, I went and reread my Zelazny books, which were also really influential to me. And like there's a bit of a meme that the best science fiction was written from the 1960s to the 
late 80s. And I really want to fight against that because there's a lot of newer science fiction that's terrific. But there is so much good science fiction written back then when the authors are starting to figure out these big ideas, trying to understand the consequences of alien contact of faster than light travel of dealing with relativistic velocity of the future changing on a society that is unprepared for it. And a lot of those things that are that are just tropes today in science fiction, they were all figured out back between the 60s and the 80s. So so if you haven't, go back and read some of those sci-fi books from back then. Yeah, Asimov was a treasure. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? I'm gonna call Q&A Plus on this week's bonus question, what's my most unpopular space take? I'm gonna put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had in this episode. Thank you, everyone, who put your questions into the YouTube comments, everybody who joined me for the live show. Uh, I will be uh, back in my regular office uh, within a couple of days now so we're flying back i think tomorrow from when i'm recording this so uh then we will be uh, sort of back into our normal schedule with all of the other interviews and stuff coming out now i'm going to talk about something that's very serious but first i'd like to thank our patrons thanks to abe kingston barely griffin brian bodie caridwin chuck hawkins commander Baylock, dark finger dave verbeff david gilton and david matz evan pro greg feely james clark jeremy Mattern, jim burke jordan young josh schultz marcel sitz michael purcell north space one step for animals.org paul robrock Rain Kaidi, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Team 49, Telescopes Canada, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So if you are following Dylan O'Donnell, who is another YouTube uh, astronomy educator, uh, you probably have learned that he's been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And uh, he posted on YouTube and he posted on Facebook, so it's public knowledge, I guess. Right now, we don't know what the diagnosis is. We don't know what stage it's at. So that's going to really sort of define the treatments. But this is a really tricky cancer. Um, so he's going to have a real battle on his hands. And so he said that he's going to be stepping back from a lot of the public stuff and focusing on what matters most, which is going to be his health. And that makes total sense. Um, and it's, man, it's so hard because you just get this out of the blue, right? Like, oh, cancer. Like, it just goes after anybody and everybody. And, you know, with Dylan's announcement, and of course, we had Dr. Becky a few months ago. Uh, it just shows you how, I don't know, precious health is and and how, you know, this can face something that faces all of us. And, you know, like, I'm sure I know I know some of you watching this right now have this diagnosis and, you know, people in my family are struggling with cancer right now and it seems so unfair and i i don't know what to say except dylan you know we're thinking about you uh we're pulling for you as best whatever we can do and we really hope that you have a uh good diagnosis of uh, successful treatment and you come out the other side of this as quickly as possible all right we'll see you next time